Thank you for joining us today. We're with Tom Anderson and Jarrett Rosenthal, who are both candidates for Metro District 3. Um, and we are, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about why both of you have decided to run and what your priorities will be. Um, so why don't we start off with Tom. Can you tell us a little bit about why you're running and, and why you think voters should pick you? Um, thanks, Helen. I'm, I'm currently a Tigard City Councilor. This is, will be my fourth year. And it's, it's become obvious that a lot of the problems that uh, Tigard is facing, just like Tualatin and Sherwood, some of the smaller cities around, are actually regional issues like transportation and, and affordable housing, things that a city the size of Tiger can't handle on its own, but needs kind of a regional representation. So I think that um, I know some of the players around the, the county, and I think that, uh, you know, my experience kind of helps in that area. Great, thank you. And Jerry? Uh, uh, Helen, first I need to, I don't mean to correct you, but it's actually pronounced Garrett, not I'm Jerry. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Technically, it's a Dutch name and it should be pronounced had it, but nobody in, in, in the United States, we don't do that. So, okay, and, well, I'll at least attempt to get it right with the Garrett part. Uh, uh, the, reasons, uh, the reasons I'm running is for, I care about regional government. I have for a long time since I worked for a regional agency in Eugene, uh, the Lane Council of Governments. I also have the professional experience that ties directly to a lot of the things that Metro does, which is I've done land use planning, I've done transportation work, I've done solid waste planning, and I've done a lot of par parks and open space planning. So these are skills that are very valuable in Metro. And the third reason is that I believe that all the small cities in our district that we're vying for have different characteristics and different needs. And I believe that since I sort of live outside of one of those cities, I don't have a particularly vested interest in any one. So I'm interested in making sure they all get represented. Metro, remember, represents not only the people, but it also represents specific city governments. So those are the reasons. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me start off with Garrett on this question. Um, Metro's role in the region has grown significantly in just the past few years with the addition of the housing affordability bond, the homeless services bond, and now it's going to voters with the transportation measure. What role do you envision Metro playing in five years from now? And how would you um, seek to shape that role? Well, that's an interesting question. First of all, remember that on the housing and the uh, homelessness issue, Metro was asked by the regional gov governments to step in because of their taxing power and because of their ability to provide a regional context. Right now, Metro's taken on a lot of responsibilities. As you say, they have land use planning, they have the, the zoo, they have the performing centers. I think a lot of it in five years is going to depend on how well the homeless, the housing and the transportation programs work. Metro will continue to be a transportation leader. They will continue to be the regional coordinator and they are working with ODOT to try and decide who actually is responsible for a lot of the corridors in the Metro area. So I see them having a probably a, a somewhat more important transportation role. As for housing and homelessness, it depends on how it works out in these five years. If it works out as well as I hope it will, as, as well as I would be committed to making it work out, then I think there may be some room for other regional issues that they can deal with. But, uh, you know, it's going to, they've taken, they've bitten off a lot of big bites and we'll see how well it chews. So do, it sounds like you wouldn't actively push Metro to um, get into to other issues at this point. Well, from a personal standpoint, I'd like to see them manage water resources because that's something I've done. And that's what I did at the uh, Lane Council of the Governments. But I don't see that at this point in time. I think there is enough resistance in the small cities to Metro taking on new regional responsibilities. I think they have to, you know, so I think that's a question that would be very good to ask in five years. I wouldn't push them to try and take on other regional roles at this time. Thank you. Um, Tom, same question for you. Metro's role has grown significantly in the past few years. Where do you see it headed in five years, five years from now? And what would you do to shape it? Well, it's been quite a, quite a difference since we first talked in, in uh, March or April with the, uh, with the COVID pandemic. Uh, Metro is facing right now a $9 mil million deficit 
for this year alone and growing. So I think the next five years is tighten your belt and hold on and probably no new programs unless they can pay for themselves. But the transportation bill is a possibility. If it passes, then it will pay for itself. The affordable housing bond and wraparound services have, have been inked and uh, they're going along. But uh, I would say stay true to your core services and not expand uh, for the next five years. It's going to take a long time to pay off these deficits and uh, get back, you know, for the, the convention center and the Portland Five centers, all these, uh, the zoo, obviously those are draining right now on, on Metro. So you mentioned the, the transportation measure and that's definitely something we'd like to get into. Um, let's start with Tom on this. Um, uh, Portland area voters in the Metro service region will be voting on the uh, transportation measure this November. Was this the right measure to put in front of voters at this time? And how would you, or if you can explain your reasons for why or why not? Was it the right measure? It's, it's very large. Maybe it didn't need to be as large as it is. It, it's incorporating quite a few road projects. The light rail project, um, the time is now for that because we've been, been planning this for 10 years and they have a federal matching grant of $1.3 billion. So that's probably very timely. Um, I support the measure. I don't love the funding mechanism of it. All these, all these road projects um, have been prioritized and they're, they're very high at the top of the list. We need to do them. Um, probably needed to do them 10 years ago and they're really state roads and highways and they haven't they haven't lived up to their their part of the bargain so metro is, is tackling some of these projects um, now the funding funny mechanism i wish they would have gone with if, if you want to if you want me to <laughs> go on to that um, i wish they would have uh, gone with a more combination of uh, gas tax or vehicle license registration tax along with maybe a payroll tax. Uh, you know, we were expecting a property tax to begin with. So that changed um, a little bit. And, uh, you know, House Bill uh, 2017 um, added a 1% payroll tax for transportation just in 2017. So it's a lot for the businesses to, to take on. And uh, there's one thing that I don't like, and that is that it doesn't sunset. And uh, so once the tax, once these things are paid for, it could continue on. I, I hope that they um, come in with a, an end date on that. Um, they can also not start at 0.75%, which I am uh, suggesting that they start at a number of 0.6% and then grow that to 0.75 over four or five years. And but you know, some of the criticisms you raised, none of those would have stopped you from uh, from blocking or from voting against putting it on the ballot. You know, it's it's a thirty year plan, and COVID has been with us. COVID would be the only instance, right, that I would have uh, said let's slow down. Um, Metro wisely said that it's not going to start until twenty twenty two. The tax and. Um, We'll see how we are in a year. I think we're going to get through this with that amount of time. But we've been planning this for 10 years. And then here comes a uh, pandemic that has lasted, you know, six to eight months so far. Uh, we don't see that it's lasting forever. But, you know, we have to plan for 20 or 30 years out. So um, I still think that people are going to get back on the roads. I know that people are working from home. But uh, I think they will get back on the roads. We're still expecting a huge influx of people in the next 20 years. So um, we do need to kind of solidify these uh, transportation issues. And Garrett, uh, same question for you. Voters will be weighing in on the, the uh, transportation measure. Um, do you think this was the right measure at the time? And um, if you do or don't, uh, if you can tell your reasons why. I do think it was the right measure. Tom and I are not entirely far apart on this. They, first of all, they spent 18 months talking to all the cities, finding out what were the high priorities, and they targeted both equity as well as safety, and these are things that have been neglected for a long time. Secondly, 
these projects don't get cheaper if you put them off. The roads don't, they don't self-heal. You have to do some things that are going to do that. And any kind of death from a crosswalk that needs to be repaired or from a bad stoplight, any kind of death is unacceptable. And the third reason is it's going to create a lot of jobs, which we have had an economic hit. These jobs will keep money locally. So I think that it's something that is necessary. And I've looked at the numbers. If you have a 0.6%, which I agree with him on that, they should start out and then ramp it up. That the kind of impact that will be on, say, a company with 40 employees and an average wage of $40, it's going to be about $9,000 in tax. And that is not compared to what their profits should be at 5%. That's going to be a very small amount. It's not really going to affect their hiring decisions. Most of the money will be paid by the largest employers in the area. That's where the very large bulk of it comes. And as we know from the recent tax reports, uh, from the recent summary from the state legislature, that a lot of these taxes, are actually, they've been doing fairly well, and there's higher taxes coming in than we expected. We are in a recession, but it's not as deep as we had feared. So I think for a lot of reasons, it's the right thing and the right time. It's, it is a bit painful. It is a heavy lift, but I think it, it's necessary. So, you know, I'd like to follow up a little bit on about that because we've talked a lot about the impact on business, but one of the um, things that the business community is pushing back against is the fact that um, local and state government is exempted from this. And so this burden is solely on the private sector um, to fund. Um, recognizing that, um, do you think that that was a fatal mistake on Metro's part in moving forward with a tax that is not going to be affecting the public sector? And this is for you, Garrett. Um, well, that's a good question. I, you know, I didn't look at all the numbers. I didn't look at all the detailed analysis that staff did. And it was sort of a last minute thing when they said, hey, we, we need to exempt the private en entities. And I think their calculation was that the impact by taxing public entities right now are actually hurting more than the larger private entities. So I think that it was a practical decision uh, does it look, would I have made it, uh, I would have had to study it a lot more detailed than, than the facts that I had available, available to me. It makes some sense because, because of the services that public entities have to provide in the COVID crisis, whether it's testing, whether it's special hospital care, special health care, or you know, even special distancing for people who are homeless, public entities really would be much harder hit on this. They don't produce a product that they get a profit for. So their, their paying tax on this would come directly out of the services that provide. They can't take it out of profits. So I think it was a practical and necessary thing, but it, it, I wouldn't say that it plays as well as it, as it could have. And, and you're making an assumption here that this is, this is going to solely come out of profits for businesses. I mean, there is an impact in terms of, um, you know, because it's tied to payroll, that, that could potentially be, um, you know, raises that would otherwise go to employees, et cetera. Does that concern you at all? That this is like, basically like I, from the South? Like I said, I've done the calculations. If you take a company that has uh, 40 employees, each making $40 an hour, your tax on that is going to be about $9,000. All right, that, that is a very small hit. Now, if they're paying minimum wage, they can't take it out on the employees. So if they're paying above minimum wage, theoretically, yes, they could delay some some salary in increases slightly, but if you're talking a company that size, which is, that's a payroll of a one and a half million dollars, let's just say their gross revenue is, is $3 million and, and, and they have a very small 5% prop, profit on that, that's $150,000. So you're talking about one fifteenth of their profits. Right, but uh, you're looking at this in a vacuum. I mean, this is basically, um, this, uh, there's already the TriMet um, payroll tax. I, I understand. I understand. But keep in mind, nine thousand dollars for a company that size, coming out of their bottom line. Where will they take it? Yeah, they might forego some raises, but my, I think they will find other ways to cut. And it certainly isn't enough to cut employees at that level. Garrett, for, forty employees at forty bucks an hour is three point three two eight million. Okay, it's higher. Thank you. Um, Tom, same question for you. $20 and 2,000 hours a year? I'm sorry. 20, I meant 2,080. I'm sorry. I meant $20 an hour. I, I misspoke. I meant an average wage of $20 an hour, which is a, 
a more moderate uh, firm. My calculations were the twenty dollars an hour. My apologies. Thank you, um, Tom. Same question for you. There, uh, there was this significant last-minute change that exempted <laughs> um, uh, government uh, agencies from this tax. So it's falling solely on the private sector. Um, do you? Do you think that Metro may have made a, a fatal mistake in going forward with that? Well, I think it was a surprise to them. I think everybody was assuming that uh, governments and municipalities would, would be paying this tax as well. And uh, the state statute came back and said, no, you can't, you can't do that. So I think it was a surprise to Metro. It doesn't look good for them. Um, I would love to have the, you know, I think the governments and municipalities should be paying this tax. Um, there are some high paying uh, jobs in, in uh, city management and uh, administration. So I, I think that there's ways that the cities can opt in if they, if they would like voluntarily. And I think that uh, maybe they should um, actually talk to the state. You know, it may be too late actually to change that statute. But uh, yeah, I think it was a kind of a big blunder not to know that beforehand. Is that something that you think would have, um, uh, you know, you had mentioned some of the other funding sources you were looking at. Um, is that something that, uh, like did Metro rush this? Should they have waited? I mean, I know you said that it's been 10 years in the making, but you know, when you have this kind of sloppiness at the last second, um, which has cost them um, pretty significant allies, did they rush, rush this? Should they have waited? Who are you asking? Think, oh, I'm sorry. This is a follow up for Tom. I okay. think that uh, you know, I the the payroll tax was nice and easy, and nice and clean, and I think it pulled very well for them, and I think that that's what they settled on. But I really think it needed to be a cocktail of about three different funding sources, just like affordable housing. When you're trying to put together a project this size, you need funding from a lot of different sources. So I think it's nice and clean to say, okay, this is going to be a payroll tax. But, and I think that, you know, the state has visions of, uh, you know, raising the gas tax for themselves and a, a vehicle uh, registration tax as well. So, you know, there might've been some politics there, but um, I guess my answer is they made it clean for the voters. And I don't know if that was the exact right way to do it. Um, and I, have to, I have to add something to what he said, is keep in mind, they started this proposal and they were doing the evaluation at the time just before COVID happened, and then they really formalized the final things. So they, they were hit with a very different situation from what they had been planning for all the way in, up through January, February. And I think that influenced their decision to make it a clean, as, as Tom says, a clean proposal. You mean just focus on payroll as opposed to yeah. some of the other? Yeah. I, I, neither one of us knows what debates went on within their staff as to they, they were looking at a, a tax that was on uh, license fees and they were also looking at uh, some, other, uh, some other sources of funding. We will not know all the detailed discussions that they had in the back rooms about exactly why they decided to go with just one, but they did it unanimously. Well, and I might add too that, uh, you know, if the state would kick in, f say, $50 million a year, that would bring that down from 0.75 to 0 0.60. And, and they've kind of battered that around, I understand, down at the state, but they can't commit to such a long period of time. So, but, uh, you know, there, there's potential for the state to, to kick in um, still after the ballot passes. Um, but my guess is if it passes that the state will use that money for something else. I mean, it doesn't seem realistic to think that there's going to be those changes um, once voters say, go ahead, you know, tax. Right. Right. So I'd like to follow up, and I think that, Tom, this would, we'd start with you on this one, okay. more on the transportation package, because we could talk about this all day. Sure. Um, the measure has been criticized for doing very little to lower greenhouse gas emissions and not doing enough to ease congestion on highways. Many also question the plan to build the light rail line to Tiger, the centerpiece of the measure. What should the appropriate balance for a transportation measure that needs widespread voter 
support to pass? Well, the, the light rail piece to Tigard is, um, you know, the Southwest Corridor goes down, you know, parallels Barber Boulevard roughly. I mean, that's the last piece. And I don't think you can actually, you know, to really judge a transportation system, you have to have all the parts to it. And this is missing a, a key part, uh, you know, to travel to, to PCC or travel to Southwest Portland. So, um, again, that is, uh, you know, that, that is, uh, the, the light rail piece is kind of, kind of separate from the, the, the road funding things. As far as the greenhouse gases, I, I just don't know where technology is going to go in the next 30 years. I, I think that we're going to be seeing elect, electric cars or, or natural gas cars. Um, I think the, the uh, technology is going to change um, significantly in the next 30 years. And um, so the climate change issue, um, the greenhouse gas issue, the light rail will get some cars off the road. Um, the safe routes to schools will help the kids walk to schools and maybe get some buses off the roads. Um, the improvements on the roads will keep people off the roads and out of congestion faster. Um, but uh, that's really all the, the, that I think Metro can do, the transportation issue. The greenhouse gases, I think, are just gonna have to wait for some technology changes. And I, and I think they're gonna be coming. And, and to plan for that and to bet on a specific type, you know, could change in the next 20, 30 years. Well, arguably that it's ever changing. And that has been something that, uh, you know, part of the reason we're here is we're playing catch up for all the deferred maintenance on our roads and projects that we've put off. So if you were to win, would you push to come out ahead on the question of or the issue of emissions and do more work now, even if it's not cutting edge technology, but recognizing that if we continue to wait, we're not tackling this problem. Is this an area that you would want to push Metro to be more aggressive on in the future? I think Metro's fairly aggressive now. I, I, I just think that uh, the opportunities aren't presenting themselves and, and when they do, I think you should um, look at them very closely. So um, again, these, the infrastructure needs to be there, whether they're electronic, electric cars or gas powered cars. So um, the, the base payments that we're making now will pay off anyway. Um, uh, again, to get into more just greenhouse elimination, that's a whole nother seg segment that Metro is just not involved with right now. And, and um, I think we just add a whole nother layer of administration to Metro and, and, and grow it in ways that, uh, you know, the state has um, the EPA and uh, we probably should uh, rely on them. Garrett, would you like me to read to uh, No, I think I can, I think I understand it? Okay. what the point was. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I guess the first point is the people, and the person who's making some of those comments is Joe Courtright, of course, and he's correct. It doesn't, the program doesn't reduce greenhouse gases by a great deal, but that really misses the point because the point of this was to deal with safety issues and equity issues and to do things that was not primarily meant to control congestion. That's really more of a problem for the state and P PBOT. Uh, I have been pushing Metro for the last five, six, seven years to include more planning for electric vehicles, particularly at regional transportation hubs, so that people particularly with disabilities have access. We aren't quite there technically, but I think they need to be making the allowance for that in some of their planning. So I've been pushing them and I would push them to, uh, to rely more. Like I said, autonomous vehicles are still a little ways off, but when they come, we need to have the system up in place. So I think that it's a, you know, I think it'll do a lot. It's gonna catch us up on a lot of things. It's gonna improve situ situations. I think Metro, I would also push Metro to push TriMet to make sure we get a little better transportation access in some of these poorer served areas. As you know, Metro can influence TriMet, but it can't tell TriMet what to do. Following up on that, um, you know, one of the candidates in the Metro District, District 5 race had suggested that, um, you know, the possibility that uh, TriMet should be folded into Metro. And I'm curious, and let's start with Garrett on this, 
do you think that that is a direction Metro should go in? That's a, that's a good question. I don't have, I, I haven't committed on that because I haven't looked at the history of TriMet in such detail. I realize there's significant problems. There may be other options. There may be an option of having a more public board that interacts or that's partly shared with TriMet without folding it in. There's other options. I do think TriMet and from talking to people in the districts in Tigard and in, in Aloha and Beaverton and, and Wilsonville and Sherwood, they tend to think TriMet is unresponsive. So my first goal would be to look at ways to make TriMet more responsive to the regional transportation planning priorities. That could involve folding it into, but I think that would be a big bite that with all the current stuff going on, I don't think the structure of Metro would be able to withstand that at this point in time. So I think just some sort of better integration and perhaps having more possibly some elected members or citizen members on TriMet would be a, a first step. Tom, same question for you. Do you think that there should be, um, you know, kind of looking forward to the future, do, do you see TriMet being a part of Metro? I don't. I, I mean, it's a possibility and it's there and, uh, but TriMet's got its own issues with its uh, retirements plans uh, are kind of, you know, they've got some, some serious budget issues coming up and, and, you know, what if a competitor comes in, in the market, a new competitor and, uh, you know, does pretty well. Uh, TriMet wouldn't, you know, Metro couldn't shift at that point. We'd be very tied to them. So I think Metro does a good job overall, but I wouldn't want to tie myself to, to uh, that. Um, ensuring transparency and holding Metro staff and uh, other counselors accountable are critical roles for each individual member. How good of a job has the council as a whole done on these fronts in terms of challenging one another, um, in terms of holding staff accountable? And what would you do to help ensure Metro lives up to that? Who are you asking? for me, Helen? Oh, and I'm sorry, it's Tom. Um, well, District 3, right, Washington County doesn't always uh, agree with Metro's decisions. And um, uh, I think Craig has done pretty well in the, in the back room to try to sweeten the deals. But I, I think that there needs to be a no vote on some of these things that come up um, every once in a while, just to say, listen, uh, um, Washington County or you know, my district is saying, is, is pushing back on this. And you know, I know that by the time they vote, just like in city council, they've they've looked at the issue, they've had staff relook at the issue, and they've they've asked questions for staff, and, and they come back and, and they do a pretty good job. But um, I think that again, uh, we th we think out here in Washington County, the Multnomah County kind of bullies um, Metro, and to get a full sh fair shake. Basically, we've got to uh, get a little bit tougher with them. And, and, you know, that doesn't mean to be rude or condescending, but it, it means to, to vote no or certainly let uh, council president know in the agenda and planning process that, uh, you know, District 3 is possibly not happy with the direction that they're going. So, um, you know, you had mentioned just some of the shortcomings you saw in the transportation measure, but it doesn't sound like you would have necessarily voted no um, when it came to the council to, to refer it. Can you give an example of a situation in which you would have voted no or um, in some way, you know, pushed back? Well, I think the affordable housing bill um, was fine, but the, the, the second, the affordable housing wraparound services bill was way too high, $2.5 billion in, in an area that Metro has not contributed ever to, to come up with uh, that large amount of money over 10 years. I, I certainly would have pushed back about that. I mean, they're still trying to figure out and, and they will, but we'll see exactly what comes out of that. But, but just a huge amount of uh, money thrown to that pro problem 
that uh, we've never done before. I think we could have started with half that amount of money and then reevaluated. But uh, that was that was a huge, huge bill. Thank you, um, Garrett. Same question for you about ensuring transparency and accountability. Um, what? How good of a job has uh, Metro? How has the Metro Council done on that front? And what would you do to help shape that? Well, it's a mixed bag. I mean, obviously, um, the transparency and accountability has pretty, been pretty good on some things, such as the uh, zoo uh, bond issue, which has been going forward and seems to be on schedule, given some blips due to COVID and under budget, and uh, the parks and open space which just uh, announced two new parks, uh, one out in uh, Washington County, not in the, our district, and one over in, the, uh, in Christine Lewis's district. So those projects seem to have been going along quite well, and there seems to be quite an openness and oversight of staff, and staff seems to be quite responsive. On solid waste, the results are a little bit more mixed. I have talked to a number of uh, people and there's a, a certain amount of frustration that the staff uh, at Metro has been a little bit high handed in terms of what to do with wet wastes and some of this recycling. So I think it varies. What would I do? I would just be open to the, the strong input from the, all the cities in the district, because like I said, Metro represents not only the people, but also the city administrations. And there is some tendency, and I've talked to the people in Wilsonville and to Wallaton and Sherwood, that Metro does not always quite understand where they're coming from and doesn't pay attention. So I've pledged to these people that I would hold, you know, periodic meetings with them and even with chambers of commerce to understand what's, what their issues are and what their concerns are. This doesn't mean they're always going to agree or always going to be unified, but I think a little bit more openness and a little more ability to get out there and, and hear what's going on out at the sort of, you know, I'd say the, the limits of uh, the Metro's involvement uh, would be more appropriate. And that goes for tra uh, transportation, that goes for land use too. Uh, obviously the, uh, the performing arts centers is pretty much a, a downtown issue, but the uh, regional governments uh, probably have a word in, in how they're managed because uh, people go in and use them. So what would you do though in terms of um, just like, for instance, is there a vote that you think you would have taken a no vote on? Or how would you have pushed back against other counselors or, um, you know, with Metro staff, for instance, when um, they, for instance, with this last minute exemption for government, is there anything that you could specifically say you would do um, in response to something like that? Well, you know, I, I, I didn't find, I didn't track it specifically the vote on, on setting a one common standard for uh, wet wastes for the cities for, uh, for recycling. I probably would have pushed back on that. I would have listened to uh, Sherwood and Hillsboro and Wilsonville and said, you know, this isn't really appropriate. On transportation, I would have, I, I don't think I would have pushed back on the process but I certainly would have been a, a strong voice for the concerns of Sherwood and the, the Highway 99 people, which includes uh, King City and Tigard. Uh, that's a corridor that sort of was neglected a little bit in the process. So I would have been a stronger voice, but I have voted against the vote to move forward with the package. No, I don't think I would have. Uh, I wouldn't have voted against the, uh, the homelessness me measure. I think I've talked to the people in these rural areas, I mean, people in Sherwood and people in Wilsonville, and they have a homeless problem. They need to address it. They have local entities that can do it. But as you know, the problem of dealing with homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse is a very complicated issue. And the, the proof is going to be in the pudding on this one. It's going to be a very tough, tough road, and we have a lot of money. Metro is going to have to be very tough in making sure we have the metrics and the follow through and the clawbacks in case people don't perform. So it's going to be, that's going to be a very big, big lift. I'm not sure, does that answer all your question? I think so. I guess, um, you know, there was, for instance, a, an audit recently, or rather the, the auditor issued a letter um, mm -hmm. detailing some of his concerns or the office's concerns um, with uh, uh, problems they found in looking at the affordable housing bond. Among the things that they highlighted were 
um, that there was no consistent definition of what administrative costs that would qualify under the 5% cap was. They, Metro is now writing those, um, those guidelines, but it does raise questions about whether the controls are in place to make sure that Metro is responsibly managing that bond and what uh, voters are getting in exchange for the $658 million that they've authorized. So anything that you can say, I, I guess, you know, that is really specifically, I guess what I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about is just how, how internally focused or how, um, you know, in what ways would you make sure that Metro is carrying out what it's, what it, um, yeah, sometimes they tend to approve things without having all the details in a row. For example, even on this uh, on this one, uh, 25 uh, employees for the uh, uh, for the transportation tax. I think they needed to have a little bit more detail as to 25 employees, full time employees, full time equivalent employees, or exactly they could have spelled that out. As to the one you mentioned, and I remember reviewing that when the auditor came up with that question, and my thought was, first of all, yeah. They should have had that outline beforehand, and I probably would have been a spokesman saying, "Hey, we want to, we don't want to go forward until we say what these five percent." But it is very common in the business practice, and I've been a consultant for many years. It is very common. I've worked with county governments many times to say you're going to hold out five percent or some small number like that for administrative costs, and usually it's challengeable. It's it, it's careless to not come up with specifics beforehand. But on the other hand, there is a desire to have a certain flexibility in, in how things are going to be managed in a new program. So I, I thought 5%, this is a reasonable number considering uh, the, the public projects I've worked on. Thank you. Um, see. And I think we start uh, actually now with you, Garrett. Um, Metro oversees several entertainment and meeting venues that are unlikely to open for business anytime soon due to the pandemic. The yeah. closures are costing Metro tens of millions in lost revenue. What more should Metro be doing to shore up its financial position or to protect the, the venues that, that it has? Well, uh, some of it is out, outside of the control of Metro. For example, if we had had some leadership at the national level and they had established national standards for airline travel, for testing, which is very common, very possible, quick, quick uh, COVID tests, temperature tests, we might have more traffic, we might have more tourists, we might have more business, we might be able to open these venues in a, in a safer manner. So. I think that that's one thing we've been hampered by, to some extent, a, a lack of national leadership on this. In fact, a total, total abysmal uh, failure to protect American people. But Metro is sort of limited in what it can do because this is a tourist business. They can open these things with very limited seating, but that's hard to get venues in there for that. I, I think they're just going to have to hunker down, cut their costs, uh, maintain skeleton crews and support state plans to provide unemployment insurance, continuing unemployment insurance for the people who would work there for venues and things like that. Uh, these are things that are only used when you have a lot of tourists and a lot of people doing social. As long as we're, as long as we're constrained on that regard, uh, I'm not sure what Metro could do. Thank you. Cut costs, be efficient, and uh, use their reserves. Tom, same question for you, just in terms of the entertainment and meeting venues that aren't likely to open anytime soon. Um, is there anything you think that Metro should be doing on that front, either to um, better protect the venues or uh, look at how to, to make up some of that lost revenue? Yeah, interesting question, because um, the city of Portland owns those venues. Uh, Metro, <laughs> Metro manages those. I don't know how Metro is going so in debt by just managing them. I, they, they laid off their part-time, you know, they have permanent part-time people that are working there. And they've of course laid the, them off because there's no events going. Um, I think they need to relook at their contracts. There, there's something there that uh, is concerning to me that uh, if we shutter the doors, fine, we'll have a little staff oversight, but um, to be, you know, I don't think we should be paying the, the rent for that. Um, 
those are Portland <laughs> properties. So that's just a little confusing to me. I would like to dig into that. And, and to be clear, it's just some of the properties um, are, are Portland City of Portland properties. Right, 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 right. For example, the Expo Center um, is uh, potentially due for some, some redevelopment there, and um, that could spur some, some growth. There, there are five buildings out there. I believe two of them are really in good shape. The other three, maybe just shutter them or uh, redevelop them, um, get a private partner um, a project that uh, comes in and um, you know, brings a new fresh, fresh idea to that, that area. Um, there's some things we can do with COVID. It's a little bit tough right now, but I, I think that is a potential. That redevelopment area right there um, is ripe, and I think uh, something that they need to look at. As you know, the exhibition center they're using the parking lot at least for some COVID testing, or at least they have plans to do that. And bear in mind these these facilities. Even when they're shuttered, there is maintenance, there is security, there's patrols, there's certain things you have to just keep doing. You have to keep the heat running and make sure that the uh, things don't degrade. So, it, and there was cleaning the filters during the smoke series, during the smoke year ep epidemic was also another problem. Thank you. Um, does anyone else on the board have any questions? Great. Um, then I think what we'll do is I'll allow each of you to give just a quick wrap up. Um, let's see, I think we started with Tom. So Garrett, why don't we start with you? Okay, uh, how many minutes do you want on this? Just a, a minute or two. Okay, well, as a wrap up, uh, like I said, I have the experience in a lot of the, 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 the specific areas that Metro does, which is land use, which is open space, which is transportation and uh, uh, and uh, what I said, land use planning already, and solid waste. The things that I would like to do if I was in Metro would be push to get more planning quicker for the Southwest Corridor, make sure the, the Southwest Max, which goes down, it's in Tigard, but it goes all the way down to Durham, make sure that gets done on time and in budget. I think those are very critical. I would think Metro should step in and resolve an issue that's very critical in my area, which is the Stafford Triangle. It's not quite in my area, but it's near where I live and part of Tuol it's of concern to Tualatin. That's a bit of, been a bit of a Donnybrook for quite a while. I would like to see that happen. And, uh, you know, I have a couple other wish lists. I, would, I want to see Metro make sure that the, uh, the IBRTP, the Interstate Bridge Replacement Project, goes forward in a constructive way and it's not just another engineering solution so that it recognizes the historical and cultural importance of the Columbia River. Metro has a voice in that. Obviously, ODOT is, is the lead. And now that the state of Washington and Vancouver are more interested, I think that has to be planned to improve transportation and probably even an expansion of the uh, MAC system. So those are things that I would want to work on. And, and, and on a wish list, I, I'd like to see the uh, study of the uh, Willamette Locks if, if that's going to be feasible. And Tom? Well, thanks, thanks for the opportunity for the Oregonian. Um, I, I, of course, like your vote, like to ask for your vote. Um, I've been on the uh, Tiger City Council for four years. Before that, I was on the uh, Tiger Planning Commission for seven years and two years as president. So I've, I've been able to work up at the dais and to read the room and to negotiate deals. Um, I feel that's kind of my strength, um, along with um, working with elected leaders in my community. Um, they know me and uh, they trust me. And I think they would uh, call me, maybe if it was even a uh, not so nice text in the middle of the night and, and I would respond. Um, I've cut budgets at, at the city of Tiger. We cut $2.5 million in 19, uh, 2019. And uh, that, that helped us recover uh, faster. Uh, and I've, we've had to tax people on uh, utility taxes and garbage rates. I've taxed, we raised our garbage rates $4 a, a bin, and we probably got 60 emails on that. I mean, I know, I know that the small, the small incremental details really matter to folks. So I'm very sensitive to that. 
So I, I thank you for the opportunity and uh, uh, I ask for your vote. Great. Thank you both. Really appreciate your time. Um, I anticipate that we'll be coming out with our endorsements uh, probably uh, this coming Sunday. So thank you. Thanks for your time and thanks for holding this. Thank you both. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you.